Hey guys, so in this video I'm gonna compare the, the Zcam E2 to the Packet 4K camera and the reason is because, uh, well, because mostly because uh, you guys were interested and, and probably the number one question I got before I even released a review of the Zcam E2 the, was basically should I be getting this camera or should I just get the Packet 4K because it is after all, what is it, like 700 bucks cheaper, right? So it's a big difference in price and that's the, the, the number one reason. I guess people are kind of wondering whether it really is it worth getting this one or should I save myself 700 bucks, maybe spend that on a rig or something and uh, get the packet 4K. So I'm gonna do side-by-side -side comparison up here and answer some of your questions. So hopefully this video will make it easier for you guys to pick between these two cameras in case you are looking at uh, buying one of them. So the first question or the first point that I'm gonna kind of talk about is the overall image quality between the two cameras. Uh, I have a simple scene up here that I set up with my two NT cameras and I'll just basically shoot it on these two different cameras and kind of show you guys what the difference is. Let's start with the packet 4K here. And now on the Z cam. Oh, by the way, on both of these cameras, I have the Lumix Vario uh, 12 to 35 millimeter lens, uh, and it's set at 35 millimeters. So you guys can see kind of exactly how it looks with that same lens. It's at f 2.8. Something that a few of you guys requested uh, was to compare the Apple ProRes between these two different cameras. So again, I'm gonna show you guys this the files, but even better, I'm gonna provide a link on my website where you guys can download the Apple ProRes files. Uh, from this camera and this camera and you can kind of see for yourself how the scene looks, how the files compare. I mean it's Apple ProRes, they should be pretty much the same, it just then really comes down to the way that the information is extracted from the sensor. So uh, again, both cameras are capable of recording in Apple ProRes and if you like working in Apple ProRes and you're thinking is there a difference, again, download the files and tell me what you think. Personally when I looked at it, I mean they both look great, you know, Apple ProRes is a great codec, so if you like working with Apple ProRes, well, you'll have it on both of these cameras. Just again, keep in mind that if you want to shoot Apple ProRes in those high frame rates or anything above 30 frames per second on the Zcam, it's not going to happen <laughs> because again, you're going to have to switch to H.265. Now, another question I got is the rolling shutter on these two cameras. So let me just quickly show you how it looks in the two different cameras. Uh, next thing is the slow motion. So uh, let's kind of quickly look at the, the different settings that we have in the slow motion and how it looks. So on the packet 4K uh, here, we go into settings. I'm in cinema 4K. So cinema 4K, I can go up to 60 frames per second. Now on the packet 4K, if I jump to cinema 4K, but 2.4 uh, to one aspect ratio. So basically the top and bottom is cut off. Then, uh, I can jump up to 75 frames per second, so slightly, you know, a few more extra frames. And this is how this footage looks. Now on the Packet 4K, if you go into the lower resolution, like in HD, then again, you can go to higher frame rates. So I'm gonna go here. And now it is cropping in on the sensor, so your field of view changes. But in return now, we can go all the way up to 120 frames per second. And this is how it looks. Now on the Z cam, it's a little bit more complicated because it depends on which, not only just which resolution, but which codec you are in, you're gonna get different settings. So right now I'm in Cinema 4K full frame. Now I'm in ProRes 422HQ, which is uh, outside of zero, basically. It's the, the, the highest quality you can get. And if I go to variable frame rate, I can go 30 frames per second. Now, if you do wanna go higher in full cinema, you know, 4K, then you can do that, but then you have to change your compression from ProRes. Now in H.265, if I go to variable frame rates, I can suddenly jump to 120 frames per second. So uh, anyways, this is how this looks. Now, if you want, you can go even higher than 120 frames per second in 4K, but then you gotta go back to the main menu and go here to the record settings and change the resolution from cinema 4K to cinema 2.41, which is again, like on the packet 4K, it just cuts out the top and the bottom. And then once you are in H.265 again, compression, 
and then cinema uh, 4k but uh, 2.41 so the, the top and the bottom isn't being recorded then you can jump all the way up to 150 frames per second now there's one more resolution setting here on the zcam which is 4k 2.41 so again it crops out the top and the bottom and uh, and it's not as wide as the kind of uh, well basically it's it's not cinema 4k it's it's uhd so in that case i'm going to click ok and then uh, you'll notice also it reframes a little bit it zooms in and then i can go back to the variable frame rate and now i can go up to 160 frames per second so that's something to be aware of is that if you crop in a slightly a little bit more and you cut out the top and the bottom and if you're recording in an h265 not an apple prores so the lower quality codec then you can go up to 160 frames per second now can you go even higher yes you can you can actually go to 240 frames per second if you change the resolution all the way uh, down to hd now in my opinion uh, yeah, I mean, you're getting much higher frame rate. You're getting twice the, the amount of frames that you get on the Pocket 4K uh, in HD. But the quality, I think, in you know, in HD on the Zcam E2 is nowhere near you know the same quality on, as on the Pocket 4K. Now, the one thing I gotta give to the Zcam is that it doesn't crop in basically on your sensor. It basically, takes the whole resolution and it just skips the lines, and that's part of the reason why I have all this artifacting or the anti-aliasing. On the Packet 4K, you don't get that. You're shooting 120 frames per second uh, in HD, but it doesn't skip any lines. It just basically crops in on the sensor. Uh, now, the good thing is that you're shooting in better codec the, with the RAW. You can also shoot in, in ProRes if you want. Whereas, again, here on the Zcam, you can't do that. So that's where I would say it's kind of hard to say which one's better when it comes to slow motion. And I'm not going to pick a winner. I'll let you guys decide. It really depends, like, are you gonna be, do you really need to shoot 240 frames per second? If you do, what is it for? Do you need that amazing quality, like cinema kind of, I would say, very clean looking image? If not, then this will be great for you, right? Because even though you'll see some anti-aliasing and stuff, it's still, you know, an image that you can use for certain applications. Uh, but at the same time, how, in, how often are you gonna be shooting 240 frames per second? Now, when it comes to shooting in 4K slow motion, that is always nice to have. Now, like I said, the Packet 4K can shoot 60 or 75, depending if you crop off the top and the bottom. Uh, and the Zcam can go up to 120 frames per second. But again, keep in mind, that's only in the lower codec. So, you know, there's a trade-off there, because if you go to the ProRes, which is the better quality codec, then you're very limited, only 30 frames per second, which then in that case, the Packet 4K is better. So those are the kind of things to think about, uh, you know, and it's not like uh, like some people just say like, oh, this thing can shoot 160 frames per second in 4K. Well, not really real full frame 4K and not in the best codec. So it's there's always something you have to kind of a trade in there. Uh, and that's always going to happen with these smaller cameras because usually they have uh, they're basically designed with a smaller processor in there, so it can't handle as much data rate and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, without basically overheating the camera. So because of that, you're always going to be kind of trading off certain things. So, um, like I said, it's you guys let me know, or maybe let me know in the comments below and tell me which camera you think wins when it comes to slow motion. Now, the next point uh, I'm going to talk about is the RAW capability. So, the Packet 4K can record in Apple ProRes and all kinds of different flavors. Uh, and the Zcam can record in, in a few flavors of, of the ProRes. Not as many, but it can still do that. Now, it also has a really nice, efficient, I would say, you know, it's really compressed, but it still looks good, uh, a codec, which is the H.265. It also technically has RAW, but it's a RAW that's not... Uh, basically, uh, right now at least, it's not natively accepted in any editing program. So you cannot just simply record and round this camera and then load that into your editing software. So you have to convert it uh, after. And so during the conversion, you're going to have to pick your settings and you're going to be after that kind of stuck with it in your editing program. The b -Raw on the Packet 4K, personally, I like it. I, I, I like it actually more than like many of the other RAW codecs like you know, I'm not even gonna talk about like airy raw, but like, for example, like like before that, my favorite raw codec was the the you know R3D files from from Red cameras. I think they were they were most flexible. Uh, you could adjust the compression ratio on these, so you could still have it raw but be compressed, so it's not crazy big file sizes. Uh, you could have all those different settings, 
and and at the same time though it gave you that flexibility of raw which allows you to change certain settings like white balance or or iso and things like that well this camera or, or b raw in particular whether it's with this camera or, or any of the other black magic cameras allows you to do that and and it actually gives you even more flexibility than the red red raw files so for example, you can change the, you know, there's a lot more different compression settings. Uh, there's constant or basically variable compression, things like that that you can do. Uh, and um, and it's a very efficient codec. So it's, it's you know, there's always gonna be differences between the different RAW formats, whether it gets debayered before or after the compression, all that stuff. So anyways, I'm not gonna get into too technical things, but at the end of the day, when it comes to, comes to pure RAW capability at the moment or the time I'm doing this video, in my mind, uh, you know, I, I personally think the, the Packet 4K wins because it's a more usable codec. You can edit straight with it in DaVinci Resolve right now or in Premiere Pro. Um, you know, and, and again, it's you can adjust the file sizes, you know, different compression ratios, things like that. With the Zcam, it's very limited. And at the end of the day, the Z-RAW is really not a codec that you can edit straight away. So it means it's kind of, it gives you an extra workflow in post-production that you know where you have to basically go through all that raw footage convert it to apple ProRes or whatever codec you're going to be working with and and that's just like an extra step that i personally wish i didn't have to take so that's where i would say when it comes to raw capabilities i think the packet 4k is the winner but you know what let me know again what you guys think and again maybe you know in the future the zcam is supposed to get or might be getting uh, apple ProRes raw and once that comes, and again, I don't know right now because I don't have it here, uh, you guys can tell me if it's in the future and you guys can you know, already have the Zcam and you've had a chance to play around with it. Uh, and for example, had a chance to use the, the Apple ProRes RAW. Let me know, what do you think? Maybe it is better at that point than the, the, you know, the B RAW. Again, a lot of this stuff is gonna come down to your own personal preference. So that's why I, I don't think it's like, this is just my opinion. When I do camera reviews, that's all I can share is my opinion. It doesn't mean that my opinion is gonna apply to everybody. So it's, you just kind of listen to it and be like, okay, don't get offended. Like some people get really like, oh my God, so aggressive or like, you know, defensive when, when I, you know, because they all have like a winner picked in their head or some people who maybe, let's say, bought this camera or that camera and then it doesn't matter. If I criticize slightly one camera, they're like, oh my God, how can you say this, Tom? You know, all these neg negative things. I'm just simply telling you what I think. It does not mean that this is, the, you know, be all of, of everything. It's you, you have your own opinion. You, everybody's gonna have a different way that they're gonna be using these, you know, filmmaking tools. So it really just depends, to, you know, to, when it comes to your workflow, what's better? Uh, just like I can't tell you whether the form factor is this one's the better or this one's the better. I don't know, it depends what you're shooting, depends what kind of work you're doing. For some certain things, this form factor of this camera will be better than that. So, um, again, that's just my opinion, but I'd love to hear what you guys think by letting me you know, know in the comment section below. So the next uh, thing I'm gonna talk about is audio. Uh, both of these cameras can record audio and there's uh, also a headphone jack on both of them so you can monitor audio, which is very important. Um, and they, they can both uh, accept both uh, powered uh, XLR microphones or three and a half millimeter uh, microphones such as, for example, the, the Video Mic Pro uh, from Rode. First, kind of I'll talk about the slight difference. So the difference is that uh, on the packet 4k you have a uh, for the phantom powered uh, mics uh, you have a, a mini xlr connection and you will have to buy a cable that converts that to a full xlr and then you can connect xlr microphone th that way uh, on the um, uh, zcam you have uh, here on the back the five pin limo mini connection is the same connection that you'll find on the Airy alexa mini uh, so it's a good good you know kind of plug it's secure and all that stuff and then also, if you want, you have the three and a half millimeter jack there on the side. Uh, I find th that, like just the placement of those things, I actually find slightly better maybe here on the Zcam because you don't have, like if you wanted to actually run two microphones connected, you can, and you don't have like, you're not fighting basically there for the space because on the packet 4K, all the plugs for the HDMI and the two audio cables, the headphones, everything, uh, USB-C, everything is here on the side and it gets kind of busy and crowded once you start connecting too many things in there. Uh, so that's one thing I don't like about the Packet 4K. But yeah, you can record with both three and a half millimeter, like those video microphones or professional XLR microphones on both cameras and you can monitor audio. Anyways, now let's hear the audio samples from the two different cameras. 
Hi, this is the test audio recorded on the Asden SMX30 microphone connected through the 3.5mm port uh, on the Zcam. This is how it sounds. And now this audio is recorded on the Packet 4K camera. And this is again using the Asden SMX30 microphone plugged in through the 3.5mm jack. All right, so the next uh, question, the next point is the monitor, so, um, or the LCD. Uh, so the Packet 4K comes with a screen. It's actually a very nice screen. It is pretty bright, but I feel like it's super bright, like, you know, outside and, and like straight out in a really harsh sunlight, then it can get difficult to, to kind of see in this. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's not the best either. Um, but otherwise, it's a very nice, clear, you know, full HD uh, LCD, and it's uh, yeah, it's just a nice display, and it's very uh, like touch responsive. So if you click on any of these things, you can change the settings, as you can see, very fast, all that stuff. So I, I love it in that sense. Um, the Zcam doesn't come really with anything. I mean, it has like a little screen here on the top, but it's uh, pretty much useless, like other than maybe for navigating the menu system. So. You, that's something you're gonna have to consider so with the Zcam. You know, already considering the fact that it's more expensive this camera, you still have to spend money on the uh, on the on the monitor. Like you'll need it to actually operate really the camera. Uh, whereas with the Packet 4K, if you're just starting out, you just get the camera, you'll be okay with just the, the built-in screen. And then later on, you'll probably want to end end up adding a monitor anyways. Like I said, because one thing, for example, I don't like about this monitor is that it doesn't. Uh, the screen i mean it doesn't rotate right you can tilt it up and down uh or if you're doing for example like selfies you can't rotate it in any way so that's why even with the packet 4k like if i'm doing simple stuff like this where i'm behind the camera then i don't need a monitor but if i'm start doing something weird maybe have the camera really high or really low or again getting a shot of myself then i always connect a, a monitor up here now the monitor that I actually connect for both this camera and this camera is actually the Port Keys BM5. I love it because it's nice and small, fairly light. It's very bright, so that's actually really good because outside and like I said, in harsh sunlight, it's easy to see. Uh, it's touch screen. On top of that, it's got a lot of really professional features like vector scope even and, and uh, waveforms and all that stuff. But also the cool thing is that if you pair this with the Zcam, you can actually use it to control the Zcam. And if you add the Bluetooth module for this monitor, you can also use that to wirelessly uh, control the Packet 4K, which is really cool. So you can even have like, let's say this monitor and let's say you have a wireless video system connected to it. And then you could actually wirelessly watch the video here and you can control this camera. So really, really, really cool thing when it comes to the monitor. That's one of the reasons why I, I use that monitor with both of these cameras. Uh, now, something that this was like a really specific thing somebody asked is to show kind of how far you can push color correction uh, with working basically with the raw file from the uh, packet 4K versus uh, basically the raw file with the, from the, the Zcam. You can't really directly color grade the Zcam, uh, basically Z raw files because you'd have to adjust your settings how you want it and then you export it as an Apple ProRes or whatever codec that you want. Another question I got uh, from another user is uh, how is the autofocus? And I uh, can't believe I'm getting this question again because when I did the comparison of the 4K packet 4K to the 6K, it was the same thing. And uh, it's a cinema camera. Come on, people. Cinema camera, both this one and this one, there is no autofocus. I mean, like you have these things where you can sort of touch and will focus on a screen, but it's, um, uh, I mean, with, not with the Z cam even, but. Uh, it, it's just, it's not really something you would want to be using uh, because it's just, again, this, these cameras are meant for fully manual operation. If you really want to, you can add the wireless follow focus system and all that stuff and you can have somebody wirelessly pull focus for you. But again, there is no, basically, let's just not even talk about <laughs> the out of focus in these cameras. All right, next question I got here is about the anamorphic capability. So both cameras actually do have a dedicated anamorphic mode. Uh, that allows you basically to record an anamorphic, which means it just records in a more of a square aspect ratio. So when you have anamorphic lenses, which kind of shoot more of a horizontal view and then they squeeze it onto uh, uh, the image sensor, and then later on you kind of de-squeeze it in your editing software, it just simply means that you, you definitely want to have a camera that has those capabilities, and both of them have it. Uh, now, if is one better than the other, well, you know what, I'll just kind of show you guys the difference. and. Uh, this shot here on the Packet 4K is shot with the Vazen 
anamorphic lens that I have. And the reason why I'm using this lens is because this one is a 1.8x uh, squeeze ratio, so it's more than some of the other lenses that I have. Uh, and it's really gonna kind of show you how it works with the camera. Uh, and now here's that same shot, but on the Z-Cam, uh, using again the Vazen uh, lens. Now, the one thing that I do like uh, on the Z-Cam when it comes to shooting anamorphic is that for just previewing purposes, you can de-squeeze the image uh, right in the camera uh, and you have more settings, basically. You have one extra setting uh, because, well, actually two extra settings because you have the 1.33x. So, for example, like the lens, like the Siri uh, lens that I've been using, uh, that you could use it with that. And then you have 1.5x, 1.8x, which is perfect for with the Vazen lens. So you can really see how your shot looks. Or you have also the 2, 2x, uh, basically, de-squeeze. On the Packet 4K, you only have two anamorphic, basically, modes. The 1.33x de-squeeze or uh, two times. Now, when I shoot with the Vazen, I just simply switch to the two times. It's not that much of a difference, but still, like, if you really, really want to see how your shot looks, it is easier to see it on, on the Vazen. Now again, keep in mind that if you get any kind of half decent monitor, like for example the port keys monitor, you'll be able to also de-squeeze the image in the monitor. So even if you're shooting with a completely different camera that doesn't have, let's say, uh, doesn't allow you to de-squeeze the image in the camera, well, you can still do it on the, on the monitor if you just get, a, again, any kind of half decent monitor. And on the monitor, then you can de-squeeze it so you can still see how your image looks. And that's kind of what I would say is when you're shooting with the Packet 4K, uh, and let's say you have like that 1.8x, you can still do it and just look at it on the back of the, 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 like using the LCD here, if you set it to two times de-squeeze. But if you really want to see how your shot looks, get a monitor and, and then you can do it this way. But if you're working, for example, with like 1.5x, there, there's not many of those anamorphic lenses, but there's a few. If you have the 1.5x anamorphic lens on the packet uh, 4K, you definitely will need a monitor. Whereas here, well, technically you don't need a monitor to squeeze it, but you're still gonna need a monitor on the Z-Cam, I guess, because you need a monitor. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you're gonna need a monitor on both cameras. So anyways, when it comes to the anamorphic, I guess it's, again, both cameras are very similar. <laughs> Another thing to be aware of when you're shooting an anamorphic on these cameras is that the frame rates, basically capabilities, will go down, but it's uh, a lot more kind of hindered on the Z-Cam. Z-Cam, basically, if you're shooting anamorphic, uh, you're, the highest frame rate you can get is uh, 50 frames per second in ProRes, whereas on, on the um, uh, Blackmagic Packet 4K, you can keep on shooting in RAW up to 80 frames per second. So it's a little bit more, if, if, in case you want to get a bit of more of that slow motion when shooting in anamorphic mode, so just something to be aware of. Now one thing you'll notice is that the Z-Cam looks a lot wider even though we're using the same anamorphic lens than the Packet 4K and that's because the Packet 4K is shooting at 2.8K resolution in anamorphic and that is essentially cropping in on the middle of the sensor, so the field of view gets cropped in a lot more. All right, the next thing uh, I'll talk about is the low light capabilities of these cameras. So. Uh, both of these cameras, like for cinema cameras, they're actually pretty incredible. Um, you know, like if you were to compare it to like a um, Arri Alexa, they're way, way better. Uh, you know, or the Ursa Mini, for example, they're way better in low light than those cameras. And they are still, uh, I would consider them cinema cameras. They have some of those capabilities and things like that. But um, it, how do they perform? Is one better than the other? I know in my review, a lot of people got a little jumpy because I mentioned that I found some noise with the Z-Cam. I didn't say it was horrible. I never said that. I just simply said, if you were to compare it to the Packet 4K, it, to me, it looked like it was a little bit more noisy at the same ISO settings, but it's still usable. I didn't say that it's not usable or that it's garbage or anything like that. But anyways, I'll just show you guys side by side now comparison of this scene with the different ISO settings. And uh, you guys can kind of tell me what you think. Is one camera better in low light than the other? Or maybe there is no difference. Again, I'll leave that up to you. All right, next question is about the stabilization. Is there actually in-body image stabilization? And no, again, these are cinema cameras and cinema cameras or any good or any self-respecting, I should say, cinema camera 
will not have in body image stabilization. Not because it's not a great feature. There's some great cameras, like for example, you know, I like using the, the Sony A6600 right now or 6500 to, uh, for like a lot of behind the scenes or vlogs. And it's great, they have the, the IBIS built into it. Cinema cameras though, you don't want it because um, th there's few reasons, but the main one is you're gonna, you can end up getting really weird artifacts, and when, especially when you're working with manual lenses and things like that. And let's say, you know, if you put in uh, IBIS and you have the camera or the image sensor stabilized, but let's say the, the camera itself is shaking a lot, you can sometimes you can get these weird things with the lens flare, you'll see that look, shot will look stable, but you'll see that the lens flare will be moving, and that's because the physically the camera was moving, but then you, essentially you could say the sensor stabilized it. Um, so that's why in, in so with cinema cameras, you really just wanna, if you wanna get smooth shots, you wanna actually stabilize the camera itself, so you don't get those weird artifacts. Uh, so you'll throw this up on a gimbal, and both of these cameras are easy to work with on a gimbal. I would say the Z-Cam is probably even easier because it is so, like if you strip it down, it's such a small camera body and it's kind of uniform. Whereas the Packet 4K, sometimes it can give you trouble with certain gimbals because of that handle that it has sticking out. Uh, but both, again, both cameras are small and they can both be put onto various gimbals so you can stabilize the shots that way. All right, another question is about the ease of use of these cameras. So um, ease of use, uh, I think it, it's gonna come down, for me again, my preference is the packet 4K. The reason why is because if the touch screen is the one thing, it really makes changing like settings and even recordings, you know, all kinds of things. Like I can just tap on the white balance and boom, right there I can change the white balance, right? Uh, it also has really nice buttons like tactile buttons that are perfectly marked, they're easy to see. Plus you have three cu custom buttons that up here that you can adjust. Uh, and then up here you have even more buttons. So like you can easily get to a lot of things using these buttons. Um, yeah, it's just for me, it's it's a camera that's easier to and quicker to adjust settings. Uh, and I've again shot quite a bit with both of these cameras. And I'm just telling you honestly, from my own experience, I find that to be a lot better. Plus this handle, I actually do like the handle, especially when you're doing like small run and gun kind of things, or even if I'm just like taking this as my kind of home video camera while I'm traveling. Uh, with my family i can just take it and it kind of you know it looks like a little photo camera so it has the handle in there and then i don't even take any rig i don't take any extra monitors i'll just use it like a simple kind of point and shoot camera uh, but that, that allows me to, to shoot really high quality video with the z cam uh the menu itself the menu i mean is not bad like if i again just kind of show you guys it's easily laid out and very, very understandable but the, so the menu itself is not bad but it's the way you navigate through the menu like if you don't have a monitor like this one and you have to use these buttons it's i don't like it because first of all, the buttons aren't very good they're not very clicky they're kind of these rubber buttons and they just you know, then they don't make it easy to click through the menu system plus also it just sometimes means you gotta go through the menu system to change certain things uh that that i think some of them uh, should be very easy to to access now you can program the buttons up here you do have actually three programmable buttons on, on the front there and, uh, uh, and then here you have some also preset buttons, so you can program them, but uh, but yeah, it's just like a slight difference. It's just not as fast, literally, that at the end of the day, that's what I found. So like the Z-Cam, if you're gonna use it for like a home video or if you like real kind of run and gun documentary or sometimes, you know, just stuff happens in front of the camera or the lighting exposure changes drastically and you just need to quickly adjust the settings when it comes to the shutter or the, the angle or the, you know, the, the shutter angle or the aperture or things like that. Uh, with the 4K, it's much quicker because you can just tap here on the screen and quickly change all those settings. The Z Cam, it's a little bit more like you gotta go through the menu and, and, and change those things. Um, or, or if you're using the, some of the preset buttons, again, you can use it, but they're not as good, or the buttons at least aren't uh, aren't as they don't always work basically as well as these buttons on the 4K. So that's what I find. That maybe takes me to the next point, which is uh, the ergonomics of the camera. So this is kind of hard maybe to, to kind of say because it depends on what you're doing again. If you're looking for a camera that you just want something very minimalistic, something simple that you can just grab in your hand and kind of start running with and start recording, then again the 4K is going to be better for that because it has that built-in handle, it has the built-in you know, LCD screen here, touch screen that you can, you can change all the settings and again like I said it's easy to change the settings. The Z Cam, when you buy it, it doesn't really come with a monitor other than that useless thing on the top. So you're gonna have to put a monitor on the top, mount it, and that right away makes it bigger. 
you don't have a handle. So then that means you're gonna have to probably add a handle. Like you see, in this case, I added this really cool handle from Small Rig um, that also holds my SSD actually for recording. So that's a cool thing. Um, now you can, for example, and that's actually another thing I forgot to talk about when, you, when it comes to monitor, you can actually also monitor shots from this camera using a phone. You can Android or, or iOS. iOS is actually slightly better, uh, but you can do that and you can even connect like directly through a cable to your phone or you can, it actually has a Wi-Fi built in and you can do that. You can connect to the Wi-Fi. On the Packet 4K, you also have wi or not Wi-Fi, Bluetooth you have. So you have some wireless capability, but they will not transmit the actual video signal. It will just allow you to uh, basically control the camera through using Bluetooth. So uh, like right now, I'm recording this whole video on the Packet 6K and I'm using my phone here uh, to, to control that camera. So, you know, using the, the Bluetooth here on my phone. So you can do that, you can do that on the 4K, uh, and you can do that same thing basically here using Wi-Fi, but you can also monitor the video itself on your phone wirelessly, which is really cool. Um, so that's kind of maybe a slight advantage there to the, the Zcam. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to ergonomics, this camera is gonna be for run and gunning it. You're really gonna have to, I would say, invest in a handle, and we're gonna invest in a handle, you means you're gonna need a cage. And if you're gonna, you know, have a, you know, or also if you wanna have, be able to see some, whatever you're recording, you're gonna need a monitor. And then if you need a monitor, you definitely need a cage because mounting it otherwise to the top of the camera is kind of, kind of iffy. So you want like something sturdy, like a good cage here. Um, and then so yeah, again, those are the things to kind of consider. Now let's say if you're looking for a camera that you're gonna mount on a gimbal, or just let's say on a drone, and that's all you're gonna use it. And then let's say you have your, you know, let's say as a B camera, you have always on a gimbal, and then your A camera, your other camera you have on sticks. Well, in that case, then this might be even better because when you get it right out of the box, it comes out basically like a little box, and it makes it much easier uh, to attach to, especially these smaller gimbals than the Packet uh, 4K. So again, depends what kind of work you're doing. So I don't know if there's a definite winner here in this category. Again, you guys let me know in the comment section below what you think, which one you think is better. I think both of them, again, will have advantages and disadvantages depending on which scenario. And finally, the last thing was, uh, well, the price, which I already talked about. But yeah, the price, again, with this camera, you're still gonna have to buy things when you buy this camera. Obviously, you're gonna have to buy you know, recording media or you're gonna have to buy batteries. It comes with one battery, but it's not gonna last you very long. Um, but, uh, and that's actually maybe another thing I forgot to mention is battery life. Well, this camera is way better when it comes to batteries. It, first of all, uses Sony NPF batteries, which I love. Uh, they're easier to find, cheaper, uh, and they're also just come in different sizes. Whereas this one uses the, the Canon, you know, uh, batteries, the small little Canon batteries, and it's, it barely powers this thing for like 40 minutes, depending also what you're doing with the camera, which settings, but that's pretty much what you should be expecting. So this camera, it's definitely, I mean, you can use it with those small Canon batteries, and I do them very often if I want like a small form factor, but then in that case, I have a packet full of, you know, those little Canon batteries. Whereas with the Zcam, I put on one of these larger, um, uh, batteries here, you know, the, the Sony NPF style batteries, but it's actually from, from a different brand that also has a DC connection, which in th that case then also lets me power my monitor. And this will actually power this whole thing for almost four hours here. So that's brilliant. So I get like two batteries like that for a whole day and you're good. So it makes a big difference there when it comes to battery life. But, um, but at the end of the day, going back to the whole price when it comes to cameras, prices, yeah, I mean, the camera itself, the Facket 4K is 700 bucks cheaper. So that means that for that 700 bucks, you can then use that, you know, basically to buy extra batteries for this or buy as one of the battery solutions that I showed in my previous video. And then you can make this camera work better and for a longer period of time. Also, you don't need to buy a monitor right away. You can, again, you can start using just this monitor, but eventually, like I said, you'll probably end up buying a monitor anyways. The Zcam, on the other hand, is kind of like, you have to buy more things right off the bat, I find. Uh, because again, most of the, most people will end up buying a cage right away, will end up buying a side handle, will end up buying um, the monitor, right? Like things like that. Um, so again, it just, you know, and overall the camera is just more expensive, right? So so when it comes to price, I guess this camera wins, but you know, for it's, they, at the same time, I don't know, is there really that much of a difference in price? Uh, I guess for some people, some people who are like looking at really kind of low budget cameras, 
um, you might never be looking then at these two but if you really like if every penny counts then you're probably going to go with this camera because you're going to be able to start shooting quicker with this one right basically before you spend less money whereas with the z cam you're just right away spending more um, but yeah anyways those are some of the the differences between the cameras again I uh, hopefully you guys see that I'm not I don't have a favorite and I personally couldn't care less I know some people out there were like oh Tom you know Blackmagic must be paying you a ton and I, I wish they were but even if they were they would just be paying me for me to just maybe do more stuff with their cameras but not to it really change my opinion because at the end of the day if you ask me and, and I'm very approachable and whether it's online or if you meet me in person at like NAB or any of these event shows or anywhere even on the street I had people recognize me then uh, ask me a question and I'll tell you and I'm telling you guys right now not right away there is no really definite winner here they're both different cameras and they're both have advantages and disadvantages in different scenarios so again I would say for gimbal work drone work this camera is better I'll just tell you right away because it's more kind of designed for that you have more peripheral kind of connections here you can do a lot of more cool stuff if you were looking for kind of a, a right out of the box kind of a small handheld a kind of a camera that then maybe later you can build up to a cinema camera then I think this one might be a winner if you're doing stuff with like real high frame rates well this one's gonna be the winner so in short basically both cameras are great and but at the same time none of them are perfect so just be aware of that there's limitations with each camera so anyways hopefully this kind of video helped you again make your decision in case you are looking at uh, buying either one of these two cameras uh, and if it did, again, let me know in the comment section below or if you guys already maybe made that choice and you already own one of these cameras and you have your own opinions, again, let me know what you think, which one you think like for you is the best camera and why, like what, tell me what kind of work you're doing because again, that's probably going to make a big difference. But anyways, that's it for this video and as always, uh, you guys can follow me on my website which is tomantosfilms.com and if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter so you're notified of more of these videos. And again, if you want to download the raw files from these, both of these cameras, again, go, go to my website uh, and you can download it there.